Um, so this is a calorimetric question. It's one of those questions you might have seen in a chemistry class. And uh, that's really my biggest excuse for not spending more time in calorimetry. Um, but I do recognize the calorimetric questions. It does involve multi-step problem solving and they can be challenging. Um, the, the other excuse for my um, not covering, not spending a lot of time covering calorimetry questions is that we don't actually use calorimetry all that much in uh, thermodynamics as we cover it in physics. So while it's uh, something that should have been your background of thermodynamic, thermal, thermal physics knowledge, um, as we move on to the remainder of the three week coverage of thermodynamics, you're not really going to see us use calorimetry. So it's the other reason we don't spend a lot of time. But since this is uh, possibly one of the homework questions, let me just uh, uh, cover it, uh, working through this one additional example of calorimetry questions. So it says uh, some mass. Let me just start by labeling these things. Um, some mass, sample of water, some temperature is in a calorimeter. <laughs> you drop a piece of steel. Okay, that's probably important um, that I'm dealing with the water and steel. With a mass, M2, uh, at uh, some other temperature, T2 into it. Okay, after the sizzling subsides, what is the final equilibrium temperature? Make a reasonable uh, evaporation. Don't, don't I? Okay. Okay. Um, and it asks um, the final equilibrium temperature of water and steel. And yeah, so this is the uh, what I keep calling calorimetric question. Um, so the setup is that you have some body of water at some temperature T1, and you are dropping in some other object at a different temperature T2 into the thing. And I think most uh, people have good intuition for what happens when you do that. Um, over time, these two things will um, come to a thermal equilibrium. They will, um, the temperature of water will rise, temperature of the block will go down, and all together, they will reach some kind of final temperature. And um, yeah, so hopefully you have that intuition. And the way to quantify how that um, comes to be is we describe that with a heat. Um, and remember, in chemistry and physics, we define heat as not um, the way we might talk about heat um, as a, uh, what some, uh, I guess, a, a thermal energy heat. When we say the word heat, the technical definition is the flow of thermal energy from uh, from a higher temperature to lower temperature. When we talk about heat, quote unquote, in this class, the technical definition of heat refers to flow of energy. Um, it's a flow of uh, energy uh, due to difference in temperature. So as you visualize this process, what we want to describe is the heat flowing out of this object and heat flowing into water. And in a well insulated calorimeter, um, I hope you have this uh, intuitive feel that total energy is conserved. So whatever heat out is of this hotter object, it has to be equal to the heat input of the colder object. And that's the starting place for um, setting the equations that you are going to solve for in a calorimetry problem. So let me write it out. Uh, we have heat out of the steel. That's going to be equal to heat into water. Um, and <laughs> I, this is the part of the physics problem solving that I hope you learned in physics 4a and to the degree that you might need to review um, calorimetry problems where you can grease those wheels again and um, and start to get back into practice of um, solving these word questions and so you do have to know some 
thing about how we express the heat in context like this. This will have to come from your chapter reading, which is the amount of heat transferred can be related to something called we, something that we call specific heat capacity that I'm going to indicate with the letter C. And specific heat capacity is related to heat transfer by uh, that constant times amount of mass. And this together is sometimes called the heat capacity, not specific heat capacity, but heat capacity together. And what heat capacity re relates to is um, how the heat transfer is related to change of temperature. So, um, so this is an expression that you do have to either be able to guess intuitively, which you might be asking a lot, but the textbook covers it. So you can also see it in textbook. So this is something that you have to know. And um, once you know that and remember that, then, then you can uh, express these expressions for heat input into steel, oh sorry, heat output out of steel and heat input into water. Um, in terms of these coefficients that you can look up, parameters that you've been given, and some expressions that you can relate to, um, you can relate to your knowns and unknowns. So let me do that. Um, I'm going to write out. Um, so there should be some specific heat capacity of steel that I can look up later, times mass of steel, I've been given that, M2, times, and oh, I need to write out the change of temperature. And here I'm going to do something that's a, a little bit unusual and something that you do have to be careful about. So normally, most of the times when we say things like delta T, most of the time what we mean is T final minus T initial. That's kind of the definition of change in temperature. Um, in this, with this particular case, I'm gonna make a bit of an exception, uh, which is designed to make it so that every quantity that I'm going to write down is going to be positive. So if I just blindly do this, then um, then here it can actually be a negative thing. But the way I wrote my equations here, it only makes sense if this is a positive quantity and this is positive quantity. So I'm going to write my equations with that awareness. So, so with that awareness, what I have to do is, um, I have to put the temperatures in correct word in correct order. So I have to say, okay, um, the steel is going to cool down. So my final temperature will be lower than T2. So this is a difference of temperature here. I want to compute it as T2, the initial temperature of steel, minus whatever the final temperature is. That's gonna be lower. So this whole quantity will be positive as it should be the way I'm writing my equations here. This is uh, an artifact of how I'm writing this equation. Okay, on the right hand side, um, so I should have specific capacity of water. This is another parameter you can look up. Times uh, mass of the water that's been given, M1, times the change of temperature of water. And here, I, after thinking through it, um, I recognize, okay, water's gonna heat up, so my final temperature will be higher, T final, minus um, the initial temperature of T1 uh, water. Uh, so, so this is the more proper way we would normally write delta T. And here I swap the order of these two because of the way I started my equation, I always want to be aware of the interaction between how I choose to write my equations and how they might affect the sign of some of the quantities. So that's my expression. And I think that might be it. So whenever I do, um, I go through problem solving steps like this, what I like to do before I do any significant amount of math is making sure that I have all the necessary information. And the way you do that in a general term is, one, uh, first, you count your unknowns. You count how many things you don't know that's involved in your equations. And looking at it here, um, this is something I can look up, so I don't care. It's fine. This has been given, so I know. This has been given, so I know. 
So, ah, T5 no, I don't know this. So this is an unknown, one unknown. Um, specific capacity of water, I can look it up. So it, I'm treating it as known. M1 I know, T1 I know. And this T final, it's uh, another, un well, but it's the same unknown as this. So I don't count it as a separate unknown. So in this equation, I have one unknown. And what I'm calling information is basically equations. So that's how information is always presented in this problem solving context. Information in, comes in the form of an equation. Equation gives you some constraint that uh, that becomes your information. So I have here, I have a one equation, one unknown. So, um, and I hope you, this is covered some place in algebra. I forget exactly where, but uh, somewhere in algebra, you learned if you have in given a system of equations, if your number of equations are the same as your number of unknowns and you have an independent system of equations, then you can solve for it. So. So I can solve for it. So let me do that. Uh, I'll just uh, go through this relatively quickly. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to first to try to collect like terms. So I'm going to try to put together all the terms with the T final on the left hand side. So that means I have um, this, uh, this, uh, these multiplied together. So minus C still times M2 times T final. And I have this T final term here that I'm going to move over to left. And when I do that, I get a minus sign. So minus C M1 T final, C water times M1 times T final. And I'm going to say, so that's all the terms, like terms I'm collecting on the left-hand side. Let me say that's equal to every all the other terms that I'm going to collect on the right hand side. By the way, I'm skipping quite a few algebra steps here, doing some of them in my head. I do strongly recommend that you get practice with algebra, that you feel comfortable with some of these um, mental algebra. Um, um, do let me know if you help doing that. Uh, there are some additional uh, steps that I could have gone through that could have helped. <laughs> so, so do let me know. Um, uh, the most important math skill in this class is really algebra. That's why I do really want to encourage people to practice. Okay, so I have the product of C M to T2. I'm going to move it over to right. So it'll get a minus sign. C still M2 T2. Um, and on the, already on the right hand side, I have a C M1 minus T1. So minus C water. M1 times T1. So, oh, I have a bunch of extra. So I can imagine multiplying through the entire thing by minus one. And when I do that, I get to cancel out all these minus signs. When I distribute it, it cancels these out. So I have basically this sum is equal to that. Everything on the right hand side is a known quantity. So what I should do is I should factor out the left-hand side. So factoring left-hand side, I get factoring out T final, the one unknown I'm trying to solve for. T final times C still times M2 plus C water times M1 is equal to C still times M2 times T2. It's a number you can calculate plus, oh, let me just scroll a little bit. Uh, C water times M1 times T1. Um, oh, and I, if I divide it through by this combination of water, uh, numbers, uh, so let me just say the same thing. <laughs> On the right-hand side, I get this numerator divided by C still times M2 plus C water times m1 and this cancels out one so plug in the numbers here for this that will get you t final and when you get the t final you should confirm to uh, verify that that t final is uh, in between 
uh, 10.5 degrees C or whatever number generated for you and uh, 209 degrees C or whatever number generated for you. Um, I'm going to guess uh, here it's probably going to be around 30 degrees C maybe. <laughs> Just guessing. Or actually even less. There's more water than um, still. So 20, 30 degrees C maybe. <laughs> when and if you plug in numbers, you will see. So... Um, yeah, so so that's uh, um, that's the calorimetry problem solving for part A. Um, part B makes this a little bit more uh, complicated, and um, I think I know the answer. So the final temperature will be um, lower, but not significantly so. And it has to do with if you have so it's a matter of how so you set up this equation as you are solving. Uh, heat out of the steel goes into uh, into the water, and if you account for the glass beaker, which is in the starts at the same temperature as water, then what you have to figure out is oh, so additional heat has to flow into the glass beaker. So there's a plus Q in beaker, which would uh, add this additional term here, plus C glass times mass of glass times T final minus T1. And when you go through um, the process here, you will figure, oh, T final is going to be uh, smaller. And, but when you, I guess it's a kind of a number sense thing. When you look at the how large the specific heat capacity of water times the mass of water is, and compare it to the specific heat capacity of glass, which is a lot slow, smaller than this, times the mass of glass, which is also smaller than amount of water, that this uh, additional term doesn't contribute a lot. Contributes a little bit, but so uh, that's what I mean, lower, but not significantly so. And doing part C <laughs> takes more algebra. Uh, so I did the first step modification here. You have to do the remainder of the modifications uh, starting from here, or maybe just redo the algebra, solving for T final and um, uh, solving for it and plugging numbers. So, so yeah, that's the calorimetry problem. And I guess uh, the third reason I do like doing calorimetry problems, they tend to be very tedious. So, <laughs> I mean, it does involve a lot of algebra steps. So it does take a lot of time and you will see me right now not plugging in any numbers because if I choose to plug in numbers, that's another five minutes. And right, this is already 30 minutes over. So I would like to end this here.